Good morning, Zoe. Hi. Um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, I'll give it just a minute or two for a few more folks to come into the live stream, and then uh, we'll get started. Okay, so I think I'm about ready to get started. Welcome to um, our live stream of uh, a demonstration for your next project. This is going to be <clears throat> a chance for you to dive into um, still life painting with color. And basically what we're going to get started on here is an underpainting method. Uh, this method is uh, based in the Renaissance and it's called, um, often called grisaille. Um, although the technique that I'm using is technically called a Brunei because it's in brown. Grisaille is a method of working from the back of the painting to the foreground, kind of taking the drawing element out of um, your thinking process with your painting. Uh, what I mean by that is that I'm going to focus entirely on my values, my lines, my proportion in this still life um, at the early stages, really before I dive into deep color. Um, artists like Ang, the French painter, and David, his teacher, uh, were really famous for using a grisaille method. It's one of the ways that they were able to get this like really kind of glowing color uh, inside their work. And so what a grisaille is, is a black and white painting that you then uh, glaze your color sources back on top of. And um, again, that kind of allows you to build um, really kind of rich glowing tones on top of it. Now the method that I prefer to a grisaille is called a brunei, and it's the same thing, um, but it uses tones of brown. And the tones of brown that I'm gonna encourage you to use, ask you to use on this project, are burnt sienna and burnt umber. Uh, now I'm using Gamblin brand burnt sienna and burnt umber, but you can use whatever you've got. I'm also working in oil. Today, if you are working in acrylic, uh, your method will be kind of similar, except that your paint's gonna dry. So when your paint dries, you're going to need to um, use more white than I use. I won't use very much white at all, and um, I'll mostly use the white of the canvas, like a charcoal drawing. And so um, if you're using acrylic, you'll need to use more white to actually pop your lights back in there. Uh, if you have any questions about that once you actually get started on this process, of course, and as always, uh, feel free to give me a call or a text. So, First couple things. You can see my still life uh, in the image down below. Now that's a photograph of the still life. What I'm looking at is a little broader, a little bigger uh, space. Um, hi Daniel, hi Zoe, good to see y'all. Um, and uh, the space that I'm gonna work in is, is we've, we've got all our trusty bobcat skull back and um, I've got a little bit more room around it. I can see a little bit more of that red um, cloth drapery behind it and I'm not 100% sure how much of that I'm going to stick with as I work but I like the reflection on the table I mean on the plate and I like the skull quite a bit so that's really going to be the focus of my image I'm thinking that the skull will be something kind of like pretty big 
in this image and like the plate kind of sizing around it. So we'll see how much more we get started or how much more we can cover uh, once that's started. Now, as far as tools go, um, I'm starting with a bristle brush. Um, this is a good brush for just kind of, it's a, it's a cheapie and you can push paint around really easily with it. It's got stiff bristles and then I've got a rag ready to go. Uh, the rag is going to be for wiping away and adding solvent. Now for today's painting, I'm going to use quite a bit of solvent. Remember to use only artist grade odorless mineral spirits. My recommended brand is Gamsol. It has the lowest um, off gassing and the lowest uh, potential for um, uh, flammability or anything like that. Uh, you'll need a lot of uh, ventilation in the space that you work. So you should have a fan on or something like that. Um, in fact, I'll bet you can hear my fan in the background. I should probably turn it off, but I'm going to leave it on. Um, you should have a fan on. And if you start to get headachey at all, like right behind your eyes, you're really going to want to quickly get some fresh air and uh, let your space air out a little bit. You'll notice it uh, pretty quickly. Um, it's not super dangerous for you, but you just don't want to sit in it for forever. Um, if you're using acrylic, of course, you'll be using water for this process, almost just like a uh, wet on wet uh, method of um, watercolor. So just a lot of water and kind of coat the surface. What I'm gonna do here is basically put a tone of burnt sienna. This is this kind of reddish tone. And I'm gonna put it across the entire surface. And what I'm doing is I'm dipping straight into my solvent. You can see how runny that is once I hit it on there. And I'm just kind of slowly building this up. You, there's not an exact, um, tone that I'm looking for right here. It doesn't have to be a specific shade of brown or darkness of value. Um, basically what I want is uh, significantly darker than the white of the canvas, um, but also I don't want it to just be coated in like a thick layer of paint because that'll be really hard to manipulate as I start to work back into it. Because remember, this is just my undertone. I'm gonna paint over all of this in the second stage of your painting. So this part of the painting, you should get on today. You want this to have a whole day to dry before you step into the next section where you start working a little bit more opaquely back on the surface and you'll mix your black for that method. Now one of the things I really like about this Brunei and just working this way, it's a little closer to drawing and charcoal uh, which is very comfortable to me and I know a lot of you like it as well from your uh, drawing one class and if you're in that position this is kind of similar to a tone subtractive uh, grayscale drawing in charcoal you coat the paper uh, in this case canvas of course with a single tone and then you smooth it all down and then you start working back into the surface As always, if you all have any questions uh, while I'm working, please just throw them into the chat and uh, I'll answer them. It'll give me something to talk about while I work. Okay, I'm fairly happy with that. Um, now I could wipe the whole surface down, but I kind of like these brush strokes right now. Um, it's, it's got a little bit of an atmosphere to it. I can kind of see like it's already a little darker at the top, uh, a little lighter at the, at the base. And I really like that. I'm a big fan of romantic painting. Um, artists like um, Caspar David Friedrich, uh, who is a German painter. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, guys like Rembrandt and um, Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, and all of those artists use a kind of this atmospheric, dark toned ground that kind of emerges from the background. And I like that. So I think I'm going to stick with this as best I can. Let's see if I can straighten up my canvas a little bit for you. There we go. Um, okay. So once you get to this stage and again, you can kind of smooth it uh, out if you want. Um, this is where I'm going to start kind of using 
my brush to draw in my still life. And I'm gonna decide a little bit about how big I want that skull. I want it, for me, bigger than life size, you know, significantly, it's about the size of my hand, maybe. This is a 16 by 20 canvas. Um, All right, so you can see that already what I'm working with here is starting to kind of tone in the darker edges of the form. And I'm letting the, the, the paint do some of the work for me. It's got a really nice uh, kind of wetness to it. And that creates a little bit of um, kind of chaos, something that I, it's gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna struggle to deal with a little bit, which I actually really like. I like that there's this element of of kind of a lack of control, letting the medium do a little bit for me uh, as I work. Um, there's the bottom of the plate right there. Kind of back edge. This side will be darker. Just to throw in a little bit there for me. Now the real fun in this method, in my opinion, starts once you start um, actually toning in your light sources and wiping away the areas that you wanna work. And I know that some of you have used a method like this before in your drawing, and it's, I want you to kind of think of it very similarly to that. So I'm gonna grab my rag, and I'm gonna to start to throw in, pull out some of the light. Now right now, this is a dry rag. If I need to pull out a little bit more white, I'll dip it directly into solvent, and then that'll let me pull quite a bit of light with it. But for right now, I want it to still have a little bit of a gray tone underneath. And I'm just gonna start to kind of pull out the light spaces of the skull. A little tricky because in that eye socket is still quite a bit of light. So for this setup, I've, I've really blasted the, um, the skull with a strong directional light source. And um, that's gonna help to create some pretty extreme lights and darks. You can really see that start to pop in on the tooth over there on the left. And that'll be kind of fun to work with right about there. And uh, yeah, so I, right now, so far, I've still had this, this really uh, heavy, um, clunky brush. And I'm gonna stick with it for a minute, but I have some other brushes that you're gonna see me dip into in a second that have a lot more control that are, are nylons, I have a round and a flat that I'm gonna use, and uh, they'll give me a lot more like depth and drawing ability. Right now though, I don't wanna to get too beholden to that. I want to feel like I can double check my light source, my position on the canvas, make sure I'm kind of excited about the painting before I ever kind of start to fall in love with all the work I'm doing. After today's uh, live stream, I will post on our canvas some images uh, from art historical references uh, that will give you some idea of how this method has been used by artists like some of the ones that I've mentioned, um, Rembrandt, uh, Ong, um, Friedrich, maybe some contemporary artists. But I really like this method. It, it, it lets me just kind of, the whole first day is kind of just drawing. And um, that, that takes some of the pressure off, I think, but it also lets you start to um, really think about your painting as if you're, you're building something rather than like kind of drawing something. It feels less, feels more structural, okay? So you're like, you're building it from the inside out uh, instead of, you know, just kind of painting it on the surface, if that makes any sense at all. Uh, so I'm gonna have the front of my table lip right about there. And you can see when I work on a, um, a plane, like the front of the table, I tone it all one tone to start, and then that gives me a lot more control later on for determining um, smaller fractional changes in the light source across that surface. So I see some variation in my um, cloth 
fabric that's draped on there, but I'm not messing with it here to start. I'm just throwing in like a pretty big tonal space of a planar analysis, if you will, that will help me to kind of understand as I work um, what's happening. Now there's some complexity right here on the front of this plate um, because there's the reflection of the bobcat into the front of the plate and there's a lot of dark versus light. Uh, right now, when I, when I work with that, you might see me like close one eye. That's to kind of get a little bit better understanding of what I'm looking at and it'll limit my, my personal perspective, what I'm uh, dealing with uh, a little bit more clearly. Uh, it's one of the reasons actually that perspective, linear perspective, um, isn't always super useful in the creation of, of accurate images because you can tell I'm already handicapping myself in a way. I'm closing an eye. Um, one of my favorite painters, David Hockney, mentioned that he said that uh, perspective is great if you want to go through life as a paralyzed cyclops. And what he meant is that it, it really takes out stereoscopic vision and it takes out movement. Uh, when you when you work in perspective, but I it's still very useful in trying to make sure that your understanding of a space is similar to that of your viewer or, or the position that you want your viewer in. So, like many other um, rules of drawing and painting, uh, you need to understand the rule so that you could break the rule well. You don't want to just accidentally be have a bad perspective because people can spot it really, really quickly. Even, even people who aren't artists and have never drawn anything in their life will walk into a gallery and say, oh, that perspective's off. And uh, you, know, you want that to happen when, when you want it to happen, not, not the rest of the time. So you can see that I've shifted to uh, a more delicate brush right now. Uh, this is a, um, uh, an Utrecht uh, number 16 flat, and uh, it's got a lot more control than the, than the um, bristle did. Now, let me show you what happens when I dip into a little bit of solvent. So I'm going to dip into some solvent, and then I'm going to hold up my rag. And I'm just going to tap off a little bit of the excess paint on my rag. And that's going to watch how much more I'm going to be able to pull away from the surface after that. So it lets me get in there and have a little bit more control to remove if I have too much dark. And it's, it's, it's more subtle than if I use the rag, for sure let me start to kind of work that space a little bit better. And at this stage, I want you to feel comfortable continuing to push things around as you realize, you know, that you've, you know, in my case right here, I just made the top of the skull a little too square. So I'm going to kind of round that back towards the zygomatic arch. The zygomatic arch is the cheekbone, basically. Uh, it arches back to the back of the skull. It's a part of the orbital um, anatomy for the eye socket. When your whole painting surface is wet, like mine is right now, um, it can be very difficult to figure out where to put your hand if you need a brace. Um, you'll notice that what I'm doing is I'm using a single pinky and I'm placing it in a mostly dry section of the painting. Um, so I try and be cautious about where I'm going with that. Um, but there are some methods for bracing yourself, uh, including using a dowel rod uh, that can, can touch the edge of your canvas or your, or your um, easel if you have one, um, but you just want to make sure that wherever you put your finger is someplace that you can correct or you can fix later on. Okay, let's put a little bit more detail in there now. So I find any kind of areas of detail, it's really, really important that you look at negative space. The negative space, of course, is the space around whatever physical object you're working in. And it will really help you to determine proportion. 
for me, it was a real kind of aha moment um, when I when I realized that I could use the space around an object to kind of fit the positive space that I'd spent so much time measuring uh, and the negative space together like a jigsaw puzzle. And then if I had it right, they would kind of go together. They would perfectly go together. And uh, that helped a lot. Now, because the value is very similar at the edge of this skull with the plate as it goes to the side, I'm letting that just blend into the edge. I won't keep that that way for forever, but for right now, I wanna kind of remind myself that, um, that those two values are very, very similar. In fact, right there is where the plate gets darker than the skull use that to kind of define the edge. Now right now you can see that I'm still only working in burnt sienna which is my lighter of my two browns. My darker brown, the burnt umber, I'm going to start pulling in here in about oh I don't know five or ten minutes. Um, if at any stage in this process, uh, to this point, you realize that you just don't like your composition at all, um, I would encourage you to just wipe it out, um, just with your rag, just wipe it down, and, and try again. There's no reason to, you know, this, this first hour of painting um, is no reason to spend the next, you know, two weeks working on a painting that isn't what you want it to be. So. I, I would recommend, I am always happier if I just make those decisions kind of quickly and say like, you know what, that's not what I want. I'd rather fix it and, and then keep beating myself up with this like mediocre setup. Um, for your still life, by the way, um, I put in a few in your assignment sheet, a few requirements of what you need to have in there. So be sure that you check uh, what those are. You should have something organic, something transparent or shiny or both, um, and you should have some kind of cloth. And those things are gonna help you to have enough variety in your forms that you, that I, you can deal with some of the techniques that'll be kind of specific to each of those forms. And they'll help, help you to gain confidence in uh, a variety of different things that you might come across as a painter that you don't wanna be like worried about transparency. Oh, what you know? What happens if, if I can't see where that goes or something? Well, you want to feel kind of comfortable with that. You want to feel like it's no big deal. Because I'm um, dipping my brush into my solvent a whole lot, I'll take a quick second to mention, just in terms of studio safety, don't leave a cup of water or coffee cup out on your on your um, palette while you're working in your lab space because what's gonna happen inevitably is that you're gonna dip your brush covered in paint and solvent into your coffee cup. And uh, yeah, you don't want that. So just leave it away from there. Be cautious with your materials. Be aware that they have the potential to cause you some harm. And uh, do your best to be careful especially if you have young ones or pets in the house. Okay, so you, you can hopefully start to see that I'm getting some nice glow uh, in, this, in the skull. And this is one of the reasons I really like this method so much is because the white of the canvas winds up providing a light source for me inside the painting. Um, I haven't applied any white it's all coming from the backside of the image, and that's creating a lot of nice, rich glow for me. Still got a few problems with proportionality. You know, this space right here from here to here is too wide. So I'm gonna start to try and correct that a little bit now. Move this space over. It's a little too dark. All of it, actually.
You'll notice again that I didn't start with a pencil or anything like that. I just dove straight into using my brush. And it's because it's in this pushing things around part um, that I can really start to feel my way into the painting. That's a personal choice. Um, many wonderful artists, uh, you know, definitely <laughs> work in pencil first and, and get everything right at a separate stage than this. It's just by me pushing this way and pulling that way, I start to feel my way around the object and I see it a little bit better. It's, it's just, and I, I personally enjoy the um, kind of looseness of the building up of that surface instead of it being like I, I get this really tight image on there and graphite and then I dive into uh, painting and I kind of paint within the lines it just always feels a little like stiff to me personally keep my coffee cup far away from my painting surface okay um, I'm pretty happy with this so far I think it's looking okay I'm going to throw in a little bit more detail to the background and then I'm going to start working with some burnt umber, the darker of the two browns, um, so that I can start to kind of see where this painting is going to go. see that the darker of the two triangles hits just kind of in your in, in your photo about right here in my line of vision it's actually over here a little bit so I'm gonna stick with what I see not with what you see um, remember that at the end of the day all that's you're, you're actually creating a new reality whenever you paint you know the reality that's on this surface is going to be the only one that matters when the painting is done the still life uh, won't exist anymore. Uh, I'll take it down. Um, there will be a photograph of it somewhere on YouTube and you all will have seen what it looked like. But beyond that, no one will ever see it again. And so um, because of that, I feel very comfortable um, changing uh, things around and, and just like letting things be what happens inside the painting. That, I find that very actually kind of soothing. Uh, that I can decide for myself, like, this is a new, a new reality, a new thing that I'm drawing. And that means that I can kind of, I can bullshit my way through it if I need to. I can lie to you. I can show you what I need to do. My dog Otis just came down here to say hi to me. Okay. I've now dipped into a little bit of burnt umber. It's much, much darker. Um, it's still very warm, but it's much, much darker than the original image. And I'm going to start in one of the, in a couple of the dark places in the skull, the, the nasal cavity right here. And actually, grab a little bit. I want to clean up, kind of pop out the highlight on this spot right here, which I really like. And I want to, I don't want to. So when I see something that needs to get brighter, what I'm doing off screen, you can't quite see it, is I took a totally clean brush, I dipped it in solvent, and then I am wiping it on my rag and then using that to pull up this great little highlight that runs right next to that. Hopefully you can see that in the image. And it's a great little highlight that's going to be a nice touch for the whole painting. And so I don't want to lose it uh, as I add in the darks. And it'll be harder to pull to get back after I've thrown in um, my burnt umber around it. So I wanted to kind of keep that clean like that. So now you're going to see how the umber will really give me a whole nother drawing and painting material uh, to work with a lot, lot darker. And it'll give me a range that I can work in. You can also blend the two, blend the sienna with the umber. And of course, blend with the kind of um, tones that you're getting from the underside of the, from the white of the canvas. 
all that can kind of mix together like so. All right, that's looking good. I think you're really gonna enjoy this method. I think you're gonna have some fun with it. Um, inevitably, whenever I teach this, this prospect in uh, painting one, I tend to have about two thirds of the class who really likes it and they use it a lot. Maybe not every time they paint, but they use it a lot. And then another one third who hates it, just really doesn't like the like slower process, doesn't like waiting to do kind of big, bold moves in color and things like that. And they, they don't really use it again later. And that's okay. Uh, if, if it's not your thing, um, you know, you'll know how to do it. So that as you change and evolve as a painter, if you need to come back and do it again, or you've got a commission, it's a, a little bit more old fashioned, you know, you wanna make kind of a gothic portrait of a friend or something like that, this is the way to do that. Like start with this method and you'll get a lot further along because it'll be closer to the way that those types of images were made originally. And so anytime that you kind of tap into something that's a little bit more authentic, your viewers will feel that, will feel that like similarity, that, that pull. One thing that I'm doing with my eyes that uh, I haven't mentioned very much because we haven't had as much time to paint together as we would if we were all in the same studio um, is I kind of blur my eyes while I work when I'm working in on value studies, which essentially that's what this is, right? This is a value study. Um, as I kind of take a soft focus with my eyes so that I kind of blur out some of the detail of the form that I'm looking at and instead just see lighter or darker than, right? So lighter or darker than the, than the thing right next to it. And that will help me a great deal in determining what to do with each little section, each little form. And it helps to keep you from getting bogged down in the complexities of something like a skull or you know, a silver platter or what have you that's got a lot of stuff going on in it. Any questions about this process so far? Throw them into the chat. If you're watching later, you know, shoot me an email. Zoe, you can buy a skull. Um, actually, this is a really good time to get skulls. Zoe says, I wish I had a skull. Um, honestly, there are some pretty cool $5 human skull replicas out there right now because we're right near Halloween. Um, I saw some, I saw a bag of them at Home Depot the other day that was like, I was very tempted by. Um, 
So you know, it doesn't have to be a real skull. You can you can start with something that's um, that's a plastic replica, and uh, uh, as long as you can spot the, the problems with the anatomy, you can even kind of correct for them. You know, sometimes all the teeth will be really kind of clunkily stuck together or whatever. Um, but if you've got a little bit of money saved up uh, for art supplies and you want a skull for your setup, um, what I recommend or the, the shop that I recommend in Portland is a place called Paxton Gate. Uh, that's where I got this bobcat skull, and uh, it's you know it's not cheap, but I think this skull was maybe forty bucks or something like that. Um, so not totally exorbitant either. Um, so if you want to start buying yourself you know, some cool still life objects for your setup, you know, I, do it. Once the world you know is somewhat back to normal, when you can leave your house again, uh, you might also go hit up the Goodwills. Uh, this uh, silver plate is a Goodwill plate that's just in our still life setup at, at Clark. You, you may have drawn it before if you've been in uh, drawing one for very, you know, or, or, or observational drawing. Okay. Let's throw some highlights into that plate. I'm starting to feel pretty good about this as a starting point for the rest of my painting. Now when it comes to a highlight, let me talk about this highlight right here that I'm working on. Um, the way to make a highlight really work is to have most of the area around the highlight be darker, like significantly darker than you might think it needs to be. And that lets you build up to the brightness so that you're not just diving right straight into as bright as possible, but instead have a chance to kind of work, work with that. So for this highlight, what I want to do is now I want to take a clean brush and really tap some straight solvent on there. And knowing that, of course, I'm going to eventually use white paint and that's going to obviously kick this up a significant notch. So right now all I'm doing is just kind of reminding myself where that highlight is gonna to need to go in the future and then darkening around it. And it's almost like watercolor at this stage, not quite because solvent is so different than water, um, but uh, it's kind of a similar method. You know, I'm letting the, 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 the canvas do most of the work in creating that undertone. Uh, Kyle asks, do you essentially just use highlights to show translucency? Um, well, you know, I, I guess the short answer, Kyle, is no. Um, you want the highlights to be, the, you know, the point of highlights are um, to advance the feeling of chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro is the Renaissance notion of light and dark. It's uh, one of the kind of rules of creating a, an illusion of three-dimensionality and a form and it is uh, it is very important in a translucent object but your highlights um are the the brightest spots in your still life the, the things that are purest white and they're they're most often uh depictions of the reflection of your light source outside of your still life or or subject whatever it is you're painting um so just like your deep darks your highlights are the other end of that spectrum so you have kind of the traditional, like this isn't always true, of course, whatever it is, but the kind of stereotype is that you have 60% grayscale, 20% uh, dark darks, and 20% light lights. Now, when it comes to highlights, that's your very lightest light that you're gonna get. So you need those in there, basically, so across this image here at the bottom that you're looking at, you're gonna have a highlight, you know, like here and here, and here, and they're gonna bounce across. And when highlights work correctly, they can create a cascading effect where you can almost feel the light bouncing in through the whole setup, um, kind of making a, um, like a, a sense that it would come in and hit the skull, you know, here and here. And that same light is what's hitting the highlight down here and here and here and here and so on, and all the way back onto this wall over here. 
And each of those things is going to create a space that, that makes your whole setup more believable, more round, and more in line with what um, your viewers are going to expect to see. Um, it's also creating the hint of a world outside your painting, right? Because it's suggesting a light source. In this case, it's an artificial light source, but um, you know, in a lot of cool, like think Vermeer paintings, that light source isn't artificial. It's a window outside the painting. And so then you open up the idea to your viewers that you can actually, that there's like a world outside this still life and that it extends beyond the boundaries of your canvas, which is a cool feeling. But, you know, to your point, in a translucent sense, like if you're painting, especially an object that's actually translucent, like a bottle, um, yeah, you need highlights in there so that that'll pop up. Um, you know, you're painting something like a camera, you know, yeah, like, you know, you've got a lot of shiny parts and you're going to need that to help you out. Okay, so I feel fairly good with this for now. Um, let me kind of see. And obviously you can keep working this. So I'm going to take a second and just kind of look and uh, look back at my skull and see what details I need to work in to place before I you know, want to uh, let this dry. And one of the reasons that I really like working in the Sienna and Umber approach is that your paint will dry very quickly. These are um, considered very lean paints, uh, meaning that there's not a lot of oil in them, <clears throat> which means that um, you can bet that this will be dry to the touch in a few hours and certainly ready to paint right back up on top of tomorrow, which is what I recommend. I think that all of you should do this part of your painting today. Get your still life set up. Um, get your light source all ready to go. And then come in and start to work in your detail in the, this method. And then uh, you'll have a better ability to uh, let that dry and come in tomorrow and start to work on the second step. Now the second step, um, step one, that's listed out by the way in your assignment sheet, be sure you read through all the instructions on that. There's a lot of details that I put into that um, that, I'll, that I'll expect you to follow. Uh, the first one being that I want you to mix your black. Um, I don't want you to use straight out of the tube black for this one. I want you to come in and mix it. Now I give you two options for mixing. Um, the first one is uh, Burnt Umber and Ultramarine Blue. And that is a, a very, very traditional natural black. You're gonna like it. It's really, it's really flexible. It's got a lot of control. Um, and it's pretty easy to use. Uh, it's, and the reason, by the way, that I want you to mix your black instead of just using straight out of the tube black is because I want you to be able to control the temperature of your grays. So shifting them towards the cool or the warm. This is gonna help make you a better colorist. Um, you want to start thinking about color a little less as what color is that, because this color gets uh, more complicated hue, or the name of the color, the, the actual color that it is. It's just one of three things you have to think about all the time in color, the others being value and intensity. So I want you to be thinking in terms of temperature, kind of all the time. You know, what, how warm is that? How cool is that? Just like in this stage, I want you to be thinking in terms of value. How light is that? How dark is that? So when you mix your black out of a warm and a cool, in the case that I'm talking about right now, that would be out of uh, burnt umber, a warm, and ultramarine blue, a cool, then you can make lots of different grays that have cools and warm attributes to them. And so that means that you're able to uh, ask yourself as you're painting in color, you know, say this skull, I could say, well, which side of that hits cool and which side hits warm? Or, and interestingly, do I want that form to advance to the viewer or recede? Because uh, we know from color theory that um, that, in, uh, that you can create a graphic sense of perspective 
by using warms or cools to push forward or fall back. So warms, warm colors on the spectrum, think fire colors, red, orange, yellow, tend to advance in the eye of your viewer. They tend to look closer, they tend to appear closer. And cool colors, uh, think water on the spectrum, blue, green, violet, uh, tend to recede. Now this is true even in colors that aren't, that just take on some of those attributes, like a cool gray, will tend to fall back into the picture plane, and a warm gray will tend to advance. So you can have a lot of, uh, it's just one more thing that you can control as a maker in your setup so that you can help your viewers basically see what you want them to see. You can control them. Notice I'm never really done, like, fixing and pushing things around. Um, if I notice something's a little off, I like to still mess with it. still like to, you know, to try and get in there and, and fix it a little bit. So, like, for instance, the top of this skull, it's, like, too strong an angle. I need to kind of get that to lay down a little bit, so I'm going to come in and start to do that. Just by darkening in the negative space around the skull kind of erase that out. So I've been painting for about 40 minutes. I'm going to try and wrap this up in the next, eh, call it 10. So if you have any questions about this method right now, uh, please go ahead and ask. And then um, I think once you're actually working in it, you might have some more questions. Um, this will be a good thing for you to throw uh, this step, your underpainting, be sure to put it into your in-progress critique page so that we can kind of see where you were working, working from. And take a look at the um, still life grading rubric for this project because you'll notice that some of your options for that are to um, keep some of the brown, some of the underpainting can show through a little bit in your painting by creating a sense of warmth underneath your colors. And that's really something I love about this method is that when you paint back on top of it, it doesn't entirely go away. All this work that you put into it winds up being something that creates a sense of warmth and control underneath your objects. And it can be a way that your colors feel more alive. Uh, once you start painting things like people, that becomes even more important because we have blood under our skin. And so you want some of that warmth to show up in your painting. <coughs> okay. Getting close. Calling it for today. You can see that you can really, there's almost no limit. You can just keep going with this step. Uh, you can continue to draw and pull things out. And we'll take a moment uh, just real briefly to add in a little bit more attention to the background. Um, the stuff around the skull, that obviously got the bulk of my attention, but. In my own personal paintings, which are usually pretty abstract, but I use underpainting. Um, I didn't always, um, and I, you know, it's not like a, a, it's not like a rule that I make myself stick by. But, um, but I like this method enough 
I, I like the results enough that I use it in my professional work um, because it does a lot to um, to really help me build up a surface. And by surface, I just literally mean like the look of the paint on the canvas um, or panel or whatever it is you're painting on. Um, it, it, by having multiple layers and multiple stages, you create a almost like a, a ground that like an archeologist, you can like excavate as you look at the painting. You can, you can take pieces of it and pull them back out. Kind of track what happened first. Kind of a shame I don't have more of that uh, red cloth in there. It's a, it's a cool, it's a cool cloth. It looks really good. I suppose I could just move that triangular block. I don't know. Maybe I will in the future. You can see a few um, student works in your assignment sheet from previous students from this class uh, and how they handled this project. Um, and I think it'll help you to get an idea of kind of what I expect um, from you. They're obviously, you know, good ones. They're ones that I decided to hang on to, but uh, you can do that too. Make a cool one. Um, find some objects that you're excited to paint. They don't have to be skulls. Um, they can be you know, photographs work really well with this. You know, imagine if you had like a photograph of something that you thought was really cool and you set it in your still life and then you had to kind of deal with it this way. Um, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see, I missed a couple questions. Jessica says, can you go over how you would approach the next step? Uh, yeah, you know what, Jessica, I should do that. Um, but I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I need this to dry is the thing. So why don't we talk about that um, a little bit more? Um, uh, after it dries. Maybe I'll do another live stream for that. But I will say this. My next step, got a dry painting. I'm going to lay out a, a um, palette of colors that'll include all the ones that are listed on your assignment sheet. So that's titanium white, a mixed black. So that uh, I talked about the ultramarine blue and the burnt umber one. That's the easiest one to manage. Uh, the other one that's an option for you is phthalo green and a lazarin crimson. It's a more industrial black. Um, it's a little trickier to use. If you use a little too much of Lazarin, it goes really purple. Uh, if you use a little too much Thalo, it goes really blue. So you've got like to hit this kind of tight spot, but it's one of my favorite blacks. It's super rich, like blacker than the blackest black, right? It's super beautiful, rich black. Um, and then, uh, uh, so you've got your mixed black, your titanium white. Then you're gonna have, think of your primaries. You want a Lazarin crimson, yellow ochre, um, probably your, yeah, or cadmium yellow or yellow lemon, um, uh, phthalo green, and um, you kind of build off of that, and you start to work in that space. And as you work on that, I don't want you to overthink it. Once you start that part of the painting, just get into the way that you like to paint. Um, you can paint very thickly and opaquely and paint out the underpainting where we don't see it very much, or you can try and be a little bit more translucent and work back on top of it where the underpainting really kind of stands out uh, in each of those steps. That really kind of winds up being a little bit up to the individual artist and up to you. And some of the examples that I put in the assignment sheet show you a couple of those methods. Uh, there's, there's like two cow skulls right next to each other in that assignment sheet. One of them, you can see a lot of burnt umber, burnt sienna underneath it, and the other one you can't see very much at all. So you're allowed to kind of figure out and manipulate that. Um, Kyle says, are the colors you listed for this assignment fair game to use in the painting if we want to add a bit of color? Hell yeah, absolutely. Like I said, Kyle, um, yes, those, you should add color. This is not a black and white painting, 
Um, you should add some elements in your setup that are uh, that have pattern, that have color, um, and just keep it a little subdued. You know, think earth tones. Um, notice that the red that I chose uh, that's over there on the side of my image is like kind of a burgundy, it's a maroon. It's not like fire engine red, it's not super vibrant. And that's just so that I don't have to deal with like extreme intensity in my work as I'm, as I'm dealing with that. I'll, I'll kind of get to it a little bit at a time, if that makes sense. So, um, but I think, I think I, I trust you all. You, you've made one painting already, it turned out great. Um, and so the next step after this part is basically what you did last week, but uh, not just in black and white. Now in this fairly limited uh, range of, of palette. Does that make sense? Um, I'm sure more questions will come up as you start to work on this and um, don't hesitate to shoot me a message and we'll talk about it as it goes. I'm excited about the one that I got started. Um, I'm really excited to see what you all start to work with uh, as this goes on. So have fun with it. Uh, I'd recommend that you jump on it today. You've got two weeks to do this piece, but it's gonna take more time than the previous painting did, for sure. Like you've got a whole underpainting you've gotta do, and then you've got to build, uh, uh, you got to make mix your own black, and then you've got to use a much broader range of color for your setup. So it's going to take more time, and you need to allow that in the space. And by the way, the point total for the assignment reflects that. It's a 150-point assignment instead of a 100-point assignment. So as you go through that, it's going to take more time. Um, so thank you all. I uh, appreciate you being here and joining me this morning. Uh, if you're catching this later, no big deal. Just shoot me any emails with uh, questions and I'll do my best to answer them quickly. In the meantime, good luck, happy painting, go get them.